Hello there. I'm Steve Balch, director of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization here at Texas Tech, and I'd like to introduce you uh, to our first Institute encounter for the spring 2016 semester. And we have a very special guest and a very special subject to talk about. Um, last evening, uh, our guest today was Professor Daniel Mahoney of Assumption College, uh, talked about to a audience uh, drawn from both the university and the general public here in Lubbock uh, about the greatness of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, and I think we're going to come back to some of the points you took up, but we're also going to speak about greatness a little more generally. Now, I, I should say that, that Professor uh, Mahoney, he is Augustan Chair uh, of Distinguished Scholarship and also Professor of Political Science uh, and Chair of the Political Science Department at Assumption College. Uh, but he is probably the foremost student uh, of Alexander Solzhenitsyn in, in the United States, writing in English. Uh, he is the author of two books on Solzhenitsyn, uh, Ascent from Ideology, and more recently, The Other Solzhenitsyn, which is a defense of the great writer from many of the misunderstandings uh, that have become current about him in the English-speaking world. And he's also the co-editor with um, Eric Erickson? Edward Erickson. Edward Erickson. He is the co-editor with Edward Erickson of the Solzhenitsyn Reader, which is probably the definitive collection of Solzhenitsyn's shorter writings, not the novels. Or maybe well, we, have, the we novels. have excerpts from the novels. Okay. Lots of new material from the Red Wheel, for example. So, the definitive collection of a whole assortment That's right. of uh, Solzhenitsyn writings, um, uh, which I certainly recommend to everyone out there. The, the subject of greatness is strangely a fraught subject uh, in both the academy and our culture. I remember a story uh, about 15 years ago when an English department in a large public university that I will not name went through all its course descriptions to look for references to greatness which were thereupon expunged. Um, uh, the folks te teaching English didn't think that greatness was an appropriate or even a fair um, uh, concept to uh, inflict on people because after all if, if some are great others are not, not terribly inclusive. Um, one person not in the department, a classicist actually, joked that if that were applied to his field they'd have to teach courses about Alexander the Ordinary. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't sure. I don't think that has penetrated classics yet, but it is symptomatic of something. I think, and I think my uh, guest today will agree, has gone awry in our culture. So, how do you understand the term greatness, and uh, in what ways should we be ready to apply it uh, in looking at um, statesmen, leaders? Well, you know, I think it's important to understand things as they are, as Pascal once said, in their grandeur and their misery. And one of the problems with an approach to historiography or the social sciences or philosophy or literature that flattens and egalitarianizes everything is you don't understand. You end up willfully negating the qualities of soul and thought and action that are worthy of admiration. Um, you know, for example, um, in the American Political Science Association, we have 47 recognized subfields in the discipline. We do not have one dedicated to the study of statesmanship. You know, uh, uh, there's a, there are there is certain uh, part of this stems from uh, powerful affects within democracy that uh, want to deny greatness is a suspect category for some of the reasons you had already suggested. Greatness suggests that while uh, the fundamental truth may entail a certain moral equality or an equality of rights among human beings, that some human beings stand out for their, uh, in terms of the cardinal virtues, courage, moderation, uh, prudence, uh, and um, 
to admit that goes against the democratic grain. I also think we live, you know, the Cultural Revolution of the 60s onwards has um, led to a kind of uh, transformation in our understanding of the democratic ideal. So, no, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, democracy is more and more identified with what one might call indiscriminate egalitarianism. Even something as um, silly as the, uh, the elimination of Washington and Lincoln's birthdays and their replacement by an amorphous President's Day is a sign, I think. You know, no one is honoring Chester Arthur on President's Day. You know, and uh, I think it was, uh, I think it's a mistake not to pay tribute to the, uh, to the man, George Washington, who is the founding father, whose character, more than his thought, his character was indispensable to the establishment and sustenance of democratic self-government in the United States. Lincoln, the great poet president who uh, uh, saved the Union and saved a Union dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Lincoln is a wonderful example because Lincoln on the one hand was dedicated to the truth of democratic equality, but he manifested qualities of soul that were by no means ordinary. And so um, I think just a common sense approach and openness to the phenomena and openness to the way things are demands that we cultivate in the young a capacity for admiration. There's something impoverished about a human being who is incapable of looking up, incapable of admiring that which is genuinely admirable. That well, which is the genuinely celebration great. of past greatness is a way of investing in future greatness. That's exactly right. To recognizing that, uh, and by the way, if we believe in a enduring or sempaternal human nature, we believe that despite what Winston Churchill called mass effects in modern life, the kind of standardization of thought and culture, human greatness is going to endure. And of course we want, uh, we want that greatness to be educated, we want it to be uh, compatible with the values of civilization. You know, Tocqueville has a wonderful line about Napoleon. He said, Napoleon was as great a man as you could be without being good. <laughs> and so, so we want our greatness to be good greatness. That's well. exactly <laughs> right. So the figures I admire are not only great men. There's a sense in which the totalitarian tyrants of the 20th century displayed a certain kind of amoral greatness. But the, the way I use the word greatness, it includes an inescapable recognition of certain high qualities of soul. As I said before, the exercise of what the tradition calls the cardinal virtues, courage, justice, prudence, temperance, that these, and especially prudence. Uh, Edmund Burke uh, famously called prudence the god of this world below. You know, that's the, the, great, the great virtue of now, this. Now, of course, that's, it's interesting that you say that because most people would not think of prudence readily when they think of greatness. Um, right. It may well be that the good and the great had prudence, but it's not one of right, those things that right, you automatically right. associate with greatness. Well, I think we tend to think of prudence as, as calculation, when a prudence and, as a moral virtue, as talked about by the ancients, by Aristotle or Burke, is more than calculation. It's the ability to reflect on the relationship between means and ends. In fact, the, uh, the Latin root of prudence uh, means foresight and so that ability to see further than others to anticipate danger to be we think of think of Churchill and de Gaulle both in the 1930s de Gaulle warning that uh, the Germans were developing the capacity for blitzkrieg and uh, de Gaulle wrote a series of books calling for mechanized tank forces that would be instead of France waiting to be attacked mm -hmm. in 1939 during the phony war while the Germans destroyed Poland. France could have taken the war to Germany. Likewise, Churchill, Churchill showed great foresight in the 30s during his so-called wilderness years where he 
he, he not only perfectly, as he put it in his Munich Pact speech of October 5th, 1938, there is no way that there could be friendship between British democracy and uh, what he probably gave, you give paganism a bad name when you describe Nazism <laughs> as paganism. No, there's a nobility to, to, to classical paganism, but but it not, Nazism represented uh, uh, the last prime minister of France before the fall in June 1940 said Hitler offered uh, the Middle Ages without mercy. And Churchill said in his uh, finest hour speech, June 18, 1940, that the, the Nazis would bring a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps con more con protracted by the lights of perverted science. So those are two 20th century statesmen who were wholly committed. Uh, they were, they had, a, perhaps they had aristocratic souls, but both uh, Churchill and de Gaulle were committed to the preservation of what they both called liberal and Christian civilization. So uh, I, I would think too prudence might also characterize George Washington in his foresight about not seeking a third term, Absolutely. not trying to be president for life. Um, you know, his, uh, when, when, when he resigned from the army <clears throat> at, the, at the end of the Revolutionary War, I think the story is when George III, of all people, heard about that, he said, well, if that's true, he's the greatest man of our age. That's absolutely right. <clears throat> There's a wonderful incident at Newburgh, New York, in uh, the fall of 1983. The Continental 17. Office, 17. Excuse me, I remember 1983, <laughs> but not 1783. In any case, <coughs> the officers of the Continental Army had not been paid in a long time. There was uh, a great deal of discontent. Um, a document was circulating, call, calling for the possibility of some kind of rebellion, maybe even march on the. On, on, on the uh, political offices of the, um, uh, uh, the Continental Parliament. And uh, uh, Washington famously addressed those officers. He, he pulled out his glasses. He said, my eyes are growing blind in service of my country. By the end of that very strategic intervention, uh, all of the officers in the room had tears in their eyes. So. And by the way, there was something theatrical about what Washington had done, but it was not merely theatrical. He, he, he reminded these men that he too has partaken in these sacrifices. He too, uh, you know, that he used his moral authority to prevent what would have been a calamity, namely the army of the United States marching against legitimately constituted civilian authority. It wasn't going to be another Cromwell. It wasn't going to be another Cromwell. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I gave lectures at the École des Autitudes de Sciences Sociales in Paris on uh, statesmanship, and one of my two-hour lectures was a comparison of Washington and Bonaparte, Napoleon. And uh, it was much harder for Napoleon to be a Washington. Well, given that, given the circumstances, given the trajectory of the revolution. But there was nothing in Bonaparte's soul that wanted to be a Washington. The idea of self-restraint and self-limitation as a legitimate quality of a great man's soul did not cross Napoleon's mind. And of course, Napoleon is defeated, he's sent to Elba, and, it, and, he, and he begins again, you know, with the Hundred Days. He, a small contingent evades southern France, marches to Paris, he makes himself emperor again, this time promising a liberal constitution, uh, not, and not out, outright despotism, and of course he's ultimately defeated by the Allied armies at Waterloo. But that contrast between Washington's, Washington knew, like, like Cincinnatus, he's often compared to the Roman general Cincinnatus, but Washington knew when to go home. And he also knew that that act of self-restraint or self-limitation was would be understood by his contemporaries and by future generations as a true mark of human greatness. Mm -hmm. You know Byron's poem that kind of ends with a comparison? Yes. Of, uh, 
Yes. And then he talks about the first, the last, the best, the Cincinnatus of the West. Mm -hmm. The name yeah. of Washington. The name of Washington. Is. That's right. That's right. <coughs> Those are great lines. Yeah. So, um, there have been many great leaders. Uh, maybe not enough, but uh, right. many. Uh, we need some now. Um, but uh, there, there must be many cases of unsung or not sufficiently sung greatness. Right. People who, uh, whose courage and nobility and self-restraint uh, made a lot of difference um, right. to the world at a critical moment. Are, are there any examples of yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are figures <coughs> that are certainly forgotten today who, de who deserve to be remembered. I think of uh, Conrad Adenauer, mm -hmm. the D'Alta, the, the old man, as yes, they called him. Right. He was already an old man when he became Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany in '49. He retired in '63, well into his 90s. But here was a man who had remained clean during the Nazi period. He had resigned as mayor of Cologne because he didn't want to collaborate with the Nazis in any way whatsoever. He had an uh, impeccable record during the years of totalitarian dictatorship from 33 to 30, 45. He managed to do the impossible. Who would have guessed in 42 or 43 that within 15 years Germany would be a member of the Western Alliance, a functioning constitutional democracy, that... Um, that there would have been a full political and even spiritual rec reconciliation between France and Germany, culminating in the great friendship and partnership between Charles de Gaulle and Adenauer. Adenauer isn't talked about all that much anymore because the student radicals and others in Germany in 68 kind of repudiated the Adenauerian Republic as being too moderate, too conservative, too old-fashioned. He was a Catholic after all, the head of the Christian Democratic Party. But uh, I think Adenauer is a figure certainly mm -hmm. worthy of mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. and further study. There were also figures like Lee Kuan Yew, the um, mm -hmm. S Singaporean leader. Now people would say that he was a semi-dictator. Well, he was an autocrat. On the other hand, uh, as autocracies go, Singapore was ruled, I think, humanely. There's a certain kind of autocracy that is nonetheless compatible with the broad outlines of the rule of law. He certainly, in foreign policy, um, provided sage guidance to American leaders from the 60s mm -hmm. through Kissinger, mm -hmm. through his successors. He, um, you know, as an analyst of geopolitics, as somebody who, uh, and he deserves a lot of credit for turning um, the, 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 the island city of Singapore yeah. with mm -hmm. no mineral resources into one of the great commercial nations in the world. And again, everything in life is comparative, mm -hmm. and uh, the Chinese model in Singapore is infinitely freer mm -hmm. than the Leninist party state model in uh, the People's Republic of China. So... Uh, uh, but yes, and uh, there, there's certainly, um, you know, when you you look at uh, you look at American history, um, I've mentioned Washington and Lincoln. I think Lincoln will stand out um, as perhaps the greatest American because, a bit of put it frankly, Lincoln had a much richer soul than Washington's. You know, Wa Washington. Washington uh, uh, was a great, an authentically great man. He, um, he, he, he uh, the, the, the political scientist, political theorist Robert Faulkner argues that you have to read Cicero's On Duties, De, De Ficis, to see the sources of Washington's self, self restraint. So he managed to combine essentially classical moral virtues. His hero was Cato. And Hato, hero was Cato managed to combine them with a genuine attachment to natural rights and to democratic so republican self-government and that combination is it's not only admirable and rare but it's um it was not to be repeated by any of his successors but with lincoln one has such depth of soul uh a little earlier i called him the poet of american democracy and he's a great embodiment of prudence. People forget, 
you know, today, this is true in elementary schools, it's true in high schools, it's true among journalists, it's true among historians. The abolitionists are seen as the true heroes. Lincoln thought the abolitionists were fanatics because they were willing to see the severing of the Union and even the indefinite expansion of slavery in the southern states as long as the United States remained unsullied by any engagement with slavery. Lincoln made very clear that slavery, chattel slavery, was utterly incompatible with human dignity and liberty. He made very clear that the fathers, the forefathers, were anti-slavery in principle, but he thought slavery needed to be ended in a way uh, uh, you know, Lincoln adamantly opposed slavery expansion because it would have meant the strengthening of the slave presence and slave principle in America, but he wasn't an abolitionist. He wanted to avoid war. He wanted to find ways of returning to the purity, you might say, of the founder and fathers. He, he thought slavery would go to its natural extinction. That's right, if, if it wasn't allowed to unduly expand. Mm-hmm. And what frightened Lincoln was, at the time of the American founding, one had a consensus. You could not find a leading Southerner who made the argument that slavery was a positive good. Some thought it was an unfortunate necessity. But, but uh, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, gave his famous cornerstone speech in 1861, where he said, chattel slavery will be the cornerstone of the new Confederate States of America and he said those poor benighted founding fathers were wrong because they believed in the equality of the races. They, they couldn't deliver on that promise fully, but they believed in it. We know better with the help of science. And, uh, and, and Stephen seemed to be suggesting that evolutionary science and all that gave support to uh, in, in egalitarian race doctrines, etc. He had other figures like Arthur de Gobineau who were mm-hmm. making similar arguments in the discourse on the inequality of the races. But I think for just for the speeches, the second inaugural is incomparable. Lincoln's second, second inaugural, when I teach it to my students, I am amazed by that the man can combine deep moral seriousness. You know, he makes very clear that a providential God stands in judgment of the United States for our complicity in the tragedy of slavery. Something that he really came to believe in the course of the war. Parts of his career, yeah. There was this, you know, he was a young man, he was a bit of a religious free thinker, so there was a tremendous, he never became an Orthodox Christian, but there was a real spiritual odyssey with Lincoln that, and, 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 uh, that deepened during the course of the war. His own suffering. His own suffering, that, and the suffering is of his fellow Americans, that's absolutely right. But, you know, the, the Gettysburg Address, that he can finally Im- invoke you know, charity for all, that he can... Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the great uh, uh, Christian social ethicist and political theologian, argued that the second inaugural was also a perfect um, document for guiding American thinking and action during the long Cold War, because... As, as Niebuhr argued, Lincoln argued, would have argued that communism, just like slavery, is a non-negotiable evil. On the other hand, he cautioned, as he cautioned the Northerners, against self-righteousness, that the, the sin and imperfection go all the way around. So Niebuhr thought that Lincoln's position managed to combine deep-seated opposition to, to radical evil, whether in the form of slavery in the 19th century or totalitarianism in the 20th century with a very salutary warning just because God is against these evils or natural justice is opposed by these evils doesn't mean everything those on the other side do is right. So a certain modesty, a certain uh, willingness to admit that our cause too is imperfect And yet Niebuhr added, that doesn't mean we're not obliged to do our damnedest to abolish slavery, to fight Nazism, to defeat communist totalitarianism, etc. So I think uh, 
the second inaugural really there's there's it's it, it it's not only uh, a ma not, not only manifests great prudence but it also uh, is a rare reflection of spiritual depth by a political man. How characteristic, I guess it's not absolutely indispensable because Washington would be the counterexample, uh, but, but how characteristic is it of great leaders, great statesmen, not only to have the vision, uh, the grasp on reality needed for prudence, but the my. vision also of higher goals, but in addition to all that, the ability to move people through their words and writing. That's How right. characteristic of greatness is that? I think that ability to move souls is a, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln was able to do it, and not only just from the Civil War, but beginning with the Peoria speech mm -hmm. in 1854, where he made clear what was at stake in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the abandonment of the Missouri Compromise, the willingness to expand slavery, the speeches on the Dred Scott decision where he showed that this had eviscerated the Declaration of Independence and a true understanding of the Constitution. So, and, and then in the great wartime speeches, uh, the first inaugural, the appeal to the better angels of our nature and the mystic chords of memory all the way to the end of the second inaugural and of course the great Gettysburg Address in between. I mean, in a way, it's impossible to think think about the terrible drama of the Civil War without Lincoln's rhetoric. He provides the poetry, he provides the, uh, the moral analysis that allows us to appreciate what was at st stake in that great Don drama. Churchill's another very interesting case. Um, I remember in 1995, uh, John Major was Prime Minister of Britain and it was the 50th anniversary of VE Day. So there were public celebrations. And the remarkable thing is how little was said about Churchill's role in the war. Part of this had to do with an egalitarian desire to downplay the singular role of one man. Some of it had to do with uh, uh, the press and the government were filled with rhetoric. This was the people's war. Well, it was a people's war. Everyone chipped in but it was the incomparable rhetoric of Churchill that uh, and, and Churchill from the very beginning, he became Prime Minister on May 10th, 1940, from the very beginning of the war, those great speeches, we shall never surrender. The peroration of the finest hour speech of the British Empire and Commonwealth last a thousand years, let men say this was their finest hour. The longer peroration is even more beautiful. But uh, uh, Churchill's speeches uh, really provided not only the intellectual and moral clarity to explain what was at stake in the war, what was at stake in this battle with Nazi uh, tyranny and imperialism, but it also provided the will. It was very, the British people and, and, and uh, the, the British people who lived through that period, Jeffrey Brast, who wrote a wonderful short biography of Churchill and lived through that period, he says, we literally felt like we could do it. That Churchill empowered us, that he gave us the moral fortitude, the political fortitude to stand up to evil. So, now these are extreme crises, and obviously a different kind of statesmanship is going to operate in, in, a, in a situation that is not marked by a civilizational emergency or the gravity of an evil tyranny on the march. But, uh, but I would say there's, going, going back to Cicero in the ancient world, there is a direct connection between outstanding statesmanship and rhetorical ability and capacity. So a great statesman uh, combines First of all, a grip on reality That's right. in depth that his colleagues, for a whole variety of reasons, may not have. Don't have. He has a moral vision That's right. that he brings to navigating that reality. That's right. And he has a poetic power, at least often has a poetic That's power. That's right. Uh, an ability to put those things together and deeply move uh, his, his fellow to citizens. To move souls, yes. Um, 
we talked about the importance of greatness and goodness, but clearly there's a kind of evil greatness too. Uh, and in your discussion yesterday of Solzhenitsyn, um, you kind of emphasize the, the, the great monster that, that Solzhenitsyn faced, and which is with us still, uh, the monster of, of ideology, this kind mm. of artificial construct in the world. Right, right. It's not true, uh, but nonetheless can be made compelling um, That's right. by somebody who's wickedly That's right. great. Um, and how does that work? Have, is, is that something that you think about, the, 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 yeah, you the know, some, evil greatness? Yes, uh, absolutely. Sometimes <laughs> I teach a course called Democratic Statesmanship. Other times I teach a course called Statesmen and Tyrants because I want them, I want my students to study um, not only the great man, the in, in, in uncontestably great men that we've spoken about from Cicero and Burke to uh, George Washington and Lincoln and Churchill but I want them to study these men who these tyrants who uh, are obviously men of remarkable capacity they too are able to move souls they too uh, they too are able to uh, uh, achieve if not enduring and ultimately humane and workable political arrangements, they're nonetheless able to, to use an image to go like, they're able to accelerate a people, accelerate a nation, ultimately in a frenzy of self-destructiveness. Um, but yes, uh, uh, John Lucas, uh, who has written many books on World War II and on Churchill, Wrote a book called *The Duel* about the battle between Churchill and De Gaulle, uh, Churchill and uh, and Hitler. He wrote a uh, wonderful book called Five Days in London, May 1940, about the crucial moment. Yes, I've the, read that. Mm -hmm. A wonderful book mm -hmm. when the British cabinet decided they were not uh, not going to give in to Halifax and Chamberlain's desire to at least be open to negotiation with the Nazis in case the war went badly. But John Lucas says. Even with a Hitler, if Hitler, and Hitler I consider to be almost ontologically evil, you know, that they, you know, his commitment to murderous hatred, his, uh, here was a man who, instead of doing what any rational state leader would have done, using prisoners, for example, to produce weapons during the war, he was more committed to his insane project of murderous hatred of the Jews, their industrial extermination, you know, then, I mean, he was, got, he, was he, 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 he was committed to the final solution even at the cost of losing the war. I mean, that's the, the an ideologue par excellence. But uh, you could imagine a different German nationalist, I don't think it would be Hitler, because Hitler was much more than a German nationalist, who would have been satisfied with adjustments to the Treaty of Versailles. Bismarck. Yes, yeah. you could have imagined that. But Hitler, you can't imagine. Raymond Aron, in one of his books, uh, The Century of Total War, says that uh, appeasement's gotten a bad name. Um, a different kind of Germany probably could have been appeased. But Nazi Germany could not be appeased. Its ambitions were absolutely unlimited. And so, again, part of prudence is being able to distinguish between different kinds of political yeah. orders and intentions. But uh, I just reviewed for Modern Age a uh, wonderful book. Ole, Oleg Klevniuk is the best contemporary Russian historian of the communist period. And he has a new biography of um, Stalin called Stalin, a new biography that has just come out in Russian and in uh, English, uh, published by Yale University Press. Reading this book, um, one sees Stalin was not simply the madman, the paranoid madman that so many people think of him in popular legend. He was a deeply learned man. Now, he read narrowly, mainly uh, in the Marxist-Leninist classics and in books that were... He was a knowledgeable music critic. Wasn't he was a music... Him? Yeah, he knew a lot. He wrote books on Marxist-Leninism mm -hmm. and linguistics and all this... He had a library of 20,000 books that he regularly read in. He, um, um, and contrary to legend, uh, he wasn't simply uh, uh, capricious. He, uh, 
he was capricious, but he was a he was a good Marxist Leninist ideologue. Mm. He, how else can you justify murdering ten or fifteen million peasants? He he was committed to the view that the peasants were backward class, that private property was the enemy. Marx famously said communism could be sen- summed up in a single sentence: the abolition of private property. You you read Klebnev's book and. Uh, there is a kind of perverse greatness to Stalin. His ability to outmaneuver everyone, to keep the entire nomenclature and, 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 and opera cheeks in, uh, in, in sway. You know, uh, uh, Yezhov carries out the first part of the purges in 36 and 37, killing hundreds of thousands of people, arresting millions more, and then like something Machiavelli would recommend in The Prince, Yezhov is arrested and replaced by Berea. You know, and... Disappears from the photographs. And, dis- <laughs> and, and they all disappear from the photographs. That's a... Uh, yeah. I, you know, subscribers to the Great Soviet Encyclopedia yeah. used to get these supplements where they were told, go to volume 4, page 303, cut this out <laughs> and put in this picture. Carlos Franchi, who had been with the July 26 movement in Cuba, was a revolutionary with Castro, but not a communist. He broke with the uh, ca- uh, Cuban Revolution in 1968, and he wrote a memoir. And there's a, a he has two pictures on the cover. One is a picture where he stood next to Castro, uh, overlooking a parade in Havana, and then the picture where he had been replaced by a tree. <laughs> so he had simply. Frankie had simply become a non-person. Was, you know. Castro was a good student of Stalin. I was a good student of Stalin in that regard, <laughs> absolutely. But no, your question is a good one, and uh, I think um, great. Uh, I like Tocqueville's remark about Napoleon because it suggests that those we most admire are those who combine greatness with a fundamental decency and humanity. Um, and the others confuse greatness with being a killing machine, uh, to quote Chateaubriand. Um, so uh, um, I, I, I think that um, uh, we don't want to worship human beings simply because they stand out or stand apart. We don't want to worship any human beings, but we want to make sure our capacity for admiration, and I would add, for making distinctions. Mm -hmm. A lot of, when you study statesmen and tyrants, when you study the various forms of human greatness and human iniquity, a lot of it entails ability to judge the quality of soul, to to make judgments about uh, whether or not, as Aristotle would say, these rulers have some even residual attachment to the common good or whether or not they're driven either by radical self-interest or even more dangerously by some kind of misplaced ideological project. Now you've also written about intellectuals. I have. Great as intellectuals. In the case of Solzhenitsyn, there's more dimensions to his greatness than only what he wrote, as important That's as right. it was. Uh, a man who suffered but was courageous throughout. That's uh, right. On the other hand, uh, you've also written about people whose lives were, were not were never tried quite to That's that right. extent. Uh, Raymond Aron, for That's example. That's right. What 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 makes an intellectual a great intellectual? That's right. Well, I'll give you the example of Aron. Aron was a star German stu- uh, French student. He had gone to the École Normale Supérieure, the best forty students in France, in I think twenty seven nineteen twenty seven. His classmate was Sartre. They were they used to call each other petit comrade. They were youthful friends, but uh, Sartre became an indefatigable defender of tyranny, terror, and totalitarianism. He went to the Soviet Union in 1951 and came back and wrote in Liberation that it was the freest country in the world. Freedom of criticism was so total there was no need for bourgeois elections. Um, and he was lying. And he was lying. And he it was, was lying. simply a lie. It wasn't a delusion. Yes, that's delusion. right. That's right. And, uh, and he uh, later said equally, 
embarrassing things about Castro and Mao. Aron had great lucidity from the very beginning about the evils of totalitarianism. He had been in Germany from 30 to 33. He saw, as he said, this was Moloch. This was, this was a fundament, and it pained him. that he, he admired German culture and philosophy, but he saw that a great cultivated people had succumbed to a barbarian. He was also a Jew, which gave him, I think, some extra sensitivity to what was at stake in the murderous anti-Semitism of the Nazis. Um, he, um, he always said that he asked the question, he says, intellectuals specialized in what Tocqueville called literary politics, abstract schemes, utopian descriptions of the future. He said he learned from his German experience. He'd come back from Germany, he met with the French foreign minister, and he gave a very detailed report of what was happening in Germany. And the foreign minister said it was a very helpful report. But then the foreign minister asked him, so what should I do? And Aron said he learned very early on as a result of the German experience to always ask the question, what should a responsible statesman do, given these facts, given these realities, given the situation? Um, and by the way, when Aron published The Opium of the Intellectuals, his great critique of um, fellow traveling intellectuals in 1955, and that book is more than that, it's really a great book of political philosophy, he was shunned by, uh, Sartre did not speak with, uh, so, uh, with Aron between 1947 and 1977. Aron's daughter, Dominique Schnepper, was a very distinguished social scientist in her own right and a uh, former member of the French Supreme Court. She told me when she was in high school in Paris in the 50s that people would literally not shake her hand because she was Aron's daughter. You know, so it took, Aron didn't care. I mean, he was committed to speaking the truth, but there was a long period where in elite French circles, mm. Aron was considered to be, and by the way, Aron was a, what I call a conservative liberal, a conservative-minded liberal. His heroes included Tocqueville and Montesquieu, but for the left Parisian intelligentsia, his clarity about communism, his commitment to political moderation, his anti-utopianism made him a traitor. And what I admire about Aron is the, um, uh, just, the, here was a life, it's only at the end of his life, he died in November 1983. His memoirs were published six months earlier and they were a bestseller. He only gained something like universal public recognition um, in the early 80s, at the end of a very long life. Uh, and, and I would say the uh, impact of Solzhenitsyn in, in France had something to do with that. The Gulag Archipelago had more success in transforming public opinion in France than in any other Western country. And so when people read, the French read uh, million, millions of copies of the Gulag Archipelago sold, and people could see that people like our own had been right all the time. You know, uh, Are there any American intellectuals of recent times you think have that greatness that our own showed? I would say I, I, I have a much greater admiration for Aron than Sidney Hook when it comes to his approach. I don't like Hook's pragmatism and his mm. debts to John Stewie too much, but Sidney Hook had that kind of courage. And, uh, and like Aron, you know, Sidney Hook was a great defender of the integrity of mm. the university mm -hmm. when it came mm -hmm. under assault in the 60s. Iron wrote a great book called The Elusive Revolution about the assault on the liberal university by the radicals in May 1968 and afterwards. Hook not only had that same utter principled uh, commitment to telling the truth about communist totalitarianism, but he saw in the 60s and 70s that rational inquiry and civil debate and discussion was under assault in the universities. So he actually formed the organization that was the predecessor to the one. Yeah, Center for Hunter. Rational right. Alternatives. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that was a good group. It was. It was. Yeah. So I, I always admired. I met Sidney Hook a couple times. I went to his Jefferson lecture in Washington in 1985, and you know all these political types are there wandering around. Sidney Hook was sitting in a chair by himself, 
so I went up to him. I was a young man, and I told him how much I admired him over the years. And uh, he volunteered to me that he was wearing a suit his wife had bought for him in 1948. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you the story about how it once called me at three in the morning because he didn't sort of recognize the time differences between the <laughs> <laughs> But I won't. Um, so to, to conclude, so, so greatness is now a suspect category. Uh, That's correct. In, in America and uh, the West. Um, what do we need to do to return to a appropriate respect, maybe an indispensable respect well, I won't tell you greatness. this. In the in uh, when I go to ordinary bookstores, the the Barnes and Nobles that are left, I see lots of people perusing biographies of Lincoln and Washington. Ronald Chernow's book on Hamilton is the basis of this uh, uh, acclaimed musical Hamilton. You know, he uses hip hop music at the service of telling, uh, of giving a very favorable account of Hamilton's life and statecraft. Um, I think there's ordinary people who have, who have not been distorted by the aggressive egalitarianism, the anti-greatness emphasis of the academy, um, still respond to human greatness. There's something in the human heart and soul that wants to look up to figures who are genuinely exemplary. So that won't go away. Um, I do think we need to challenge the uh, dominant orthodoxy. Um, um, it begins early on in grade schools and high schools. Elitism is the bete noir. You know, uh, equality is understood in a homogenizing and flattening way. Um, I think we, we, we need we need to, uh, those of us in the academy especially, need to convey to the young that a free society depends on virtues, virtues of character, political virtues, um, um, a certain capacity for judgment that is, uh, and what uh, Isaiah Berlin in a wonderful essay called that you alluded to before, the sense of reality. You know, and uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna learn that stuff by getting a PhD in political science. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't learn to have a PhD in political science, but these are not the kinds of things that are taught. But um, I th I think um, I uh, one thing I'm trying to do through my scholarship is to write books that um, that highlight a series of human beings who whose whose thought and action are worthy of respect and admiration, who are exemplars of greatness in our time. And all of them are men who recognize common human dignity, common humanity. So their understanding of greatness is not at the expense of our democratic ideal. But I do think um, um, you know, I had a publisher not too long ago who didn't want me to use the word statesmanship in a book because it had man in it. Pol you know, political leadership is a, is, a, is a different category. It's a little flatter. It's a, it includes a lot of different people. Statesmanship, by definition, suggests exemplary lives, exemplary achievements. So um, I lucky, I'm lucky to be teaching in a small political science department where all of my colleagues consider uh, you know, such an approach to political science education to be a good thing, to be a choice-worthy thing. Um, I just think we have to keep on fighting the battle. Um, I think this tyranny of race, class, and gender as categories for analyzing the motives, the thought, the action of human beings is absolutely destructive. It, um, it, um, we, we've, lo we've lost interest in the motives of acting men and thinking men and, and, and replaced it by a tyrannical identity politics. Um, so I have no proposals for reform other than for scholars like myself to fight the good fight and, uh, and hope that our books and our talks and our writings and the, the public prints have some in 
can provide support for that inchoate sense of ordinary people. Those people I talked about at Barnes & Noble who want to read Team of Rivals, who want to read Richard Brookheiser's biographies of the founders or Lincoln, who want to, uh, you know, who, who, who still have that capacity to, to look up and admire. Well, I don't think anyone who has heard you today or last evening or has read your books can have any doubt about your fighting the good fight. So keep on doing it, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Steve.